Most of us have eaten a pie at one time or another, for they are as familiar a British food as fish and chips. Nowadays, however, they are more likely to be eaten for dinner in the average home than they are to be found on the menu of a high-class restaurant. But this wasn't always so. The origins of the pie go back thousands of years and can even be found depicted on the walls of Egyptian tombs and in ancient Greek and Roman texts. In the early medieval period, the crust was, apparently, so thick to withstand long baking that it was mostly discarded as inedible. Later, the French and Italians refined pie-making, adding butter, rolling and folding dough, producing a tastier, flaky pie that would be more familiar to us today. The dinner tables of wealthy Tudors would include elaborate pies with meat, fruits and spices. Though the rest of the population still ate pies, albeit with more humble ingredients, such as rabbit and pigeon. Fancy pies with game meat remained popular with the aristocracy and gentry into the 18th century, and, with the coming of industrially produced pottery containers, when flour wasn't readily available to act as a baking vessel due to a wheat shortage. It was set to feed the masses, and sold from pie shops and by street vendors, the itinerant pie man could be seen everywhere there were crowds, being so popular a food as to appear in many a print or engraving. Indeed, who can forget the well-known nursery rhyme, Simple Simon, who met a pie man going to the fair, published in the second half of the 18th century. With the coming of the Victorians, middle-class aspiration and household inventions, such as the Sawyer stove, meant that pie-eating was a popular way of impressing to your peers that you could afford to eat game, such as grouse and partridge. At least, that was, until its appeal to snobbery waned. For most people, however, the pie was a cheap street food sold by peddlers and pie shops that recognised that the working class in towns and cities needed something quick and affordable to eat. These pie-men were, for much of the era, a common sight at markets and fairs, calling attention to their hot wares for sale at just a penny a pie. The wandering pie man was a prominent character in the highways and byways of London. He was said to be generally merry, and was always found where merriment was going on. Furnished with a tray about a yard square, either carried upon his head or suspended by a strap in front of his breast in the thickest crowd. If you bought from the penny pie man, you were buying cheap food, but it was cheap for a reason. Vendors had to sell a lot of pies because margins were small. So who knew what kind of meat you were getting? For a street seller was unlikely to make a living serving customers prime quality beef, even if advertising it. It was said that penny pie eating declined about the early spring season when fruit was out of season, and so a succession of tabbies mysteriously disappeared. If gossip to that effect spread among the buying public, False claims could also be made to damage the trade of competitors, then customers all but disappeared. Mutton was a popular filling, so too fish, particularly eels, and fruits of many varieties, though, oddly, rhubarb was considered medicinal and therefore not appropriate for pies, even when other fruit was scarce. Today, in a time before the pie man disappeared from Britain's streets, after pie shops had driven them out of business, we journeyed to the 1840s to hear an account of pie selling on the streets of 19th century London. This is told by Henry Mayhew, a journalist who, writing in the 1840s, observed and documented the lives of everyday people in Victorian London, interviewing the working class and making a record of his conversations. You will discover how pies were sold and what pie men, who struggled to earn a living, filled them with. Some of it meat of such dubious quality that a customer who found themselves eating one over seasoned with pepper really should have questioned why and put health before sating their hunger with cheap penny pies. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, Check out the description for links to ways you can help us continue bringing the past alive. The itinerant trade in pies is one of the most ancient of the street callings of London. The meat pies are made of beef or mutton. 
the fish pies of eels, the fruit of apples, currants, gooseberries, plums, damsons, cherries, raspberries, or rhubarb, according to the season, and occasionally of mince meat. A few years ago the street pie trade was very profitable, but it has been almost destroyed by the pie shops, and further, the few remaining street dealers say, the people now haven't the pennies to spare. Summer fairs and races are the best places for the pie men. In London, the best times are during any grand sight or holiday making, such as a review in Hyde Park, the Lord Mayor's show, the opening of Parliament, Greenwich Fair, etc. Nearly all the men of this class, whom I saw, were fond of speculating as to whether the Great Exposition would be any good to them or not. The London pie men, who may number about forty in winter and twice that number in summer, are seldom stationary. They go along with their pie cans on their arms, crying, Pies all ot, eel, beef or mutton pies, penny pies, all ot, all ot. The pies are kept hot by means of a charcoal fire beneath, and there is a partition in the body of the can to separate the hot and cold pies. The can has two tin drawers, one at the bottom, where the hot pies are kept, and above these are the cold pies. As fast as the hot dainties are sold, their place is supplied by the cold ones from the upper drawer. A teetotal pie man in Billingsgate has a pony and shay cart. His business is the most extensive in London. It is believed that he sells twenty shillings worth, or two hundred and forty pies a day. But his brother tradesmen sell no such amount. I was out last night, said one man to me, from four in the afternoon till half past twelve. I went from Somerstown to the horse guards and looked in at all the public houses on my way, and I didn't take above one shilling sixpence. I have been out sometimes from the beginning of the evening till long past midnight, and haven't taken more than fourpence, and out of that I have to pay a penny for charcoal. The pie dealers usually make the pies themselves. The meat is bought in pieces, of the same part as the sausage makers purchase. The stickings at about threepence the pound. People, when I go into houses, said one man, often begin crying meow or bow-wow-wow at me. But there's nothing of that kind now. Meat, you see, is so cheap. About five dozen pies are generally made at a time. These require a quarter of flour at five or sixpence, two pounds of suet at sixpence, one and a half pound of meat at threepence, amounting in all to about two shillings. To this must be added threepence for baking, one penny for the cost of keeping hot, and twopence for pepper, salt, and eggs, with which to season and wash them over. Hence the cost of the five dozen would be about two shillings sixpence, and the profit the same. The usual quantity of meat in each pie is about half an ounce. There are not more than twenty hot pie men now in London. There are some who carry pies about on a tray, slung before them. These are mostly boys, and, including them, the number amounts to about sixty all the year round, as I have stated. The penny pie shops, the street men say, have done their trade a great deal of harm. These shops have now got mostly all the custom, as they make the pies much larger for the money than those sold in the streets. The pies in Tottenham Court Road are very highly seasoned. I bought one there the other day, and it nearly tucked the skin off my mouth. It was full of pepper, said a street pie man, with considerable bitterness to me. The reason why so large a quantity of pepper is put in is because persons can't exactly tell the flavour of the meat with it. Pie men generally are not very particular about the flavour of the meat they buy, as they can season it up into anything. In the summer, a street pie man thinks he is doing a good business if he takes five shillings per day, and in the winter if he gets half that. On a Saturday night, however, he generally takes five shillings in the winter and about eight shillings in the summer. At Greenwich Fair, he will take about fourteen shillings. At a review in Hyde Park, if it is a good one, he will sell about ten shillings worth. The generality of the customers are the boys of London. The women seldom, if ever, buy pies in the streets. At the public houses, a few pies are sold, and the pie man makes a practice of looking in at all the taverns on his way. Here his customers are found principally in the tap room. Here's all ought, 
the pie man cries as he walks in, toss or buy, up and win em. This is the only way that the pies can be got rid of. If it wasn't for tossing, we shouldn't sell one. To toss the pie man is a favourite pastime with costermongers, boys and all that class, some of whom aspire to the repute of being gourmands and are critical on the quality of the comestible. If the pie man wins the toss, he receives a penny without giving a pie. If he should lose, he hands it over for nothing. The pie man himself never tosses, but always calls head or tail to his customer. At the week's end it comes to the same thing, they say, whether they toss or not, or rather whether they win or lose the toss. I've taken as much as two shillings sixpence at tossing, which I shouldn't have had if I hadn't done so. Very few people buy without tossing, and the boys in particular, gentlemen out on the spree at the late public houses will frequently toss when they don't want the pies, and when they win they will amuse themselves by throwing the pies at one another, or at me. Sometimes I have taken as much as half a crown, and the people of whom I had the money has never eaten a pie. The boys has the greatest love of gambling, and they seldom if ever buys without tossing. One of the reasons why the street boys delight in tossing is that they can often obtain a pie by such a means when they have only a halfpenny wherewith to gamble. If the lad wins, he gets a penny pie for his halfpenny. For street mince pies, the pie man usually makes five pounds of mince meat at a time, and for this he will put in two dozen of apples, one pound of sugar, one pound of currants, two pound of critlings, critlings being the refuse left after boiling down the lard a good bit of spice to give the critlings a flavour, and plenty of treacle to make the mincemeat look rich. The gravy, which used to be given with the meat pies, was poured out of an oil can, and consisted of a little salt and water browned. A hole was made with a little finger in the top of the meat pie, and the gravy poured in until the crust rose. With this gravy a person in the line assured me that he has known pies four days old to go off very freely and to be pronounced excellent. The street pie men are mostly bakers who are unable to obtain employment at their trade. I myself, said one, was a bread and biscuit baker. I have been at the pie business now about two years and a an half and I can't get a living at it. Last week my earnings were not more than seven shillings all the week through, and I was out till three in the morning to get that. The pie men seldom begin business till six o'clock, and some remain out all night. The best time for the sale of pies is generally from ten at night to one in the morning. Calculating that there are only fifty street pie men plying their trade in London the year through, and that their average earnings are eight shillings a week, we find a street expenditure exceeding one thousand and forty pounds, and a street consumption of pies amounting nearly to three quarters of a million yearly.